we're actually early for you. Yeah. That clock is <coughs> fast, so this is good. Okay. But I'm um, so uh, committee. I do apologize, um, and everyone in the room. I apologize. Mm -hmm. The L car went over, and it was a contentious issue that needed to mm -hmm. be resolved before we left. And I'm going to ask that that not happen again because it can't happen. Was it anything that's sitting in my committee? Might be. There's about three of them, I think. You're sitting in El Car and in Bills at the same time. So S-185, that was really a discussion, and I just wanted to bring the committee up to, um, there's another bill, S-225, that looks at Regional Planning Commission uh, planning for health care needs through like an HRAP uh, health resource allocation plan in each individual regional planning area. That's in S-225 that is in another committee, and I thought we might consider that while we were looking at S-185. So that was the only discussion, and I did talk with Katie about it yesterday. And, I, and when I asked Katie, she, she said... Did, no, she, she didn't. She I wasn't didn't, quite sure what yeah, she... Yeah, that's okay. Well, so it's on our agenda for next week. Next Thursday morning is going to be devoted for a lot to S185, which is the resilience planning through the regional planning commissions. So I just, that's all that was. And I know that uh, Abby is here, who's an intern at UBM, and she's working with me on this issue, so I thought it was important just to give her a heads up. Okay, so um, welcome, Commissioner. Good morning. And thank you for being here. Of course. You're, it's way overdue, <laughs> um, seriously, but we know you've been busy uh, speaking with other committees, and we welcome you to um, talk with us for a, about an hour right. um, on the mental health 10-year plan. I know how hard you've been working on that. Good, thank you. Okay. Uh, should I get started? Please. Okay. Uh, for the record, Sarah Sporrow, Commissioner of the Department of Mental Health. Uh, pleasure to be here this morning. Um, committee members should have a copy of the presentation um, on your iPads, um, and I will walk that through. Uh, please let me know. We'll pause for any questions um, that come up, and I'll just defer to the chair on kind of the flow of questions um, and getting through the presentation. Uh, but essentially, uh, the Department of Mental Health um, took our charge from the legislature very seriously in terms of uh, doing our due diligence to articulate a comprehensive uh, vision for a holistic and integrated healthcare system as, I go, as we go forward. Um, for the past 10 years, Vermont has absolutely solidified itself as a leader in healthcare reform, uh, but we still have gaps in our system. Um, fundamentally, um, our mental health and healthcare systems are separate systems. Um, we know that there is no health without mental health. Um, so this 10-year plan are, allows us to articulate our end state. Uh, where do we want to go as a system of care? And what are the short-term, mid-term, and long-term strategies and actions that will be required uh, to get us there? Does everyone have the presentation up in front of them? We yes. do. OK, yeah. great. Beautiful colors. <laughs> <laughs> So the next slide is just related to the charge um, that we did have a legislative charge out of the Act 200 Section 9 report um, where we wanted to really look at this idea of integration of healthcare and mental health and to work towards integrating mental health in the broader healthcare system uh, more intentionally. Um, it's very important to remember that this process um, was hinged um, on the fundamental value of stakeholder involvement and engagement and to involve Vermonters um, in articulating a vision. Um, so that includes community members, um, individuals who identify with lived experience, peers, family members um, who have all contributed their voices to the 10-year plan. Um, and again, we feel like this is a very strategic effort on behalf of the Department and the Agency of Human Services uh, because I feel like if we don't know our end state, and we don't know our next step. Uh, we will continue to um, fall into the trap of relying on band-aids and quick fixes, which actually get in the way of the long-term fundamental solutions that we really need uh, to move our system of care forward. So essentially what Vision 2030 has achieved um, is taking vision um, into an actionable plan 
Um, it weaves together the health needs of Vermonters um, and takes policy into practice. I do want to talk a little bit about the stakeholder engagement um, and the process that led to and informed this important work. Um, our Vision 2030 plan is the result of a year-long effort. Um, we took the charge to involve stakeholders very seriously. We fanned out across the state of Vermont um, in five locations across the state. Uh, we had over 300 Vermonters attend those sessions. Um, we used appreciative inquiry as a framework. That's a strategic framework um, where it kind of moves away from change management 101, systems and people as problems to be solved, and move towards what could be, um, and how do we build on the strengths of our current system and move forward um, to achieve the vision uh, that we would like to see for Vermonters. Uh, once we completed the statewide listening tour, um, we had a vision for what Vermonters wanted to see from the mental health system of care. Um, we knew and know that a vision without a plan is hope, and we knew that we needed more than hope to move this work forward. Uh, so we had uh, a think tank that was comprised of about 25 systems leaders um, that came together and had the somewhat daunting task of taking the vision of Vermonters, um, those ideals for our 10-year um, vision for our mental health system of care, um, and to translate that into an actionable plan for the future um, that we could all commit to. Um, the think tank uh, met uh, for about five sessions, um, again, representative of peers, advocates, um, systems partners, representative from our designated mental health agencies, and our health care partners that came to the table, inclusive of OneCare, um, folks from UVM, CVMC, other hospital partners who all contributed, and again, had that daunting task of synthesizing the vision into an actionable blueprint. We also had a think tank advisory group, um, which was comp comprised of additional um, individuals uh, who kind of pro they provided checks and balances for us as the 10-year plan began to evolve uh, they were great thought partners in helping us think about different things how to refine specific action areas uh, that were urgent and important to moving the work forward uh, we also used our adult state standing committees and our children's standing committees um, to provide input and feedback uh, we opened it up for public comment I believe we received over 52 public comments um, on the 10-year plan uh, so we had our work cut out for us in terms of incorporating all of these ideas um, into a concrete, actionable plan. So, so I'm sorry, that did include then uh, people who have have been patients or clients of the system and their and their families. Absolutely. That, yeah. um, so the stakeholder engagement, I would say, we had an incredible turnout of family members, of individuals with lived experience. Um, we held two sessions, so we held one session in the afternoon. Um, where we tended to have more providers, if you will, um, that were participating in those sessions. And then we also had evening sessions um, where more individuals um, who had experiences um, receiving services in the system of care, um, peers, family members who came and shared their thoughts um, and quite frankly, their powerful stories. Um, and what worked for them in the system, uh, which we wanna know, um, and what didn't work for them. <coughs> One of the things uh, that we wanted to frame and anchor our vision in um, is the quadruple aim of healthcare. Um, so we have organized on slide five, hopefully my slides align with yours, um, that we have tried to incorporate and frame our work within that quadruple aim, which is that we want to improve client experiences, we want to improve the health of all populations, whole health population approach, we want to reduce the cost of care, and we want to improve healthcare provider experience. When we think about what does holistic mean, um, it really means, and when we think about integration. Sorry, it's actually seven. Slide seven. Slide seven. Oh, okay. Thank yeah. you. Sorry. I'll try to. <laughs> We're good. These, these ones aren't on the numbered, so Thank you'll you. probably have to help me orient to the, the PowerPoint presentation since I don't have it in front of me. Um, but essentially, when we think about holistic, um, it's about the interconnectedness um, between health and mental health, which we around this table all agree with. Um, and as I mentioned before, fundamentally, our systems are still separate. Um, and that we have to take into account mental health, also the social determinants of health, which we'll also be talking about um, as fundamental um, to this work. 
And we think if we can get this right, that Vermonters will have improved access to care, they'll be healthier, happier, and that the state will realize significant economic benefits. We also look nationally, um, and when you follow the national conversation, um, national trends and practices are moving towards the integration of mental health and physical health care. Um, since the deinstitutionalization of mental health care began in the 1950s, um, states have naturally been utilizing our community mental health systems more. Um, that's a good thing. Um, this vision and many models of integration are hinged on our ability to work across sectors as partners. That includes mental health, that includes health care, substance use, working with patients, families, communities, law enforcement, um, and other community partners um, that are involved um, in the mental health care of individuals. Um, it's also essential that successful implementation of this vision and plan um, will require the buy-in and engagement of not just mental health partners coming to the table, but our health care partners coming to the table with us, aligning and committing to this vision. Uh, I think we operationalized and saw that commitment in terms of our healthcare pro providers participating in the development of this plan. Um, if you actually read the report, um, you can see who the think tank members were, how many of them represented healthcare providers. Um, but if we really want to move this forward, um, then we need to anchor it um, and have that buy-in from key leadership across the state. So one of our recommendations uh, is that we uh, have some kind of board or council that will have some kind of oversight related to this work, that continue to follow this work, um, to uh, pay attention to the implementation of the 10-year plan, and to continue to look strategically at opportunities that we have across healthcare and mental health um, to keep working towards integration. And so as you're gonna, you'll be talking about the board or the council? And yes. The, and the, its constituency? Yes, we okay. actually have some draft language um, that we could send to the committee in terms of our recommendations on representation. Yeah, good. Um, okay, good. I'll save my questions for it. Great. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, Kathy, maybe you can help me with the slide numbers. Um, these ones aren't numbered um, to help me orient to where oh, our no, folks no. are. Um, so the next slide is really a visual related to the social contributors to health, um, a.k.a. the social determinants of health. Um, and again, the creation of this 10-year plan is really grounded in the idea um, that the health of individuals um, is improved when we improve the health of communities. Um, so you'll see that interwoven into this report, um, that that was a fundamental value, um, that by working towards creating healthy communities, um, Vermonters are able to attend to their mental health without concern. Um, that includes basic needs, um, et cetera, that we all know um, impact overall health and well-being of Vermonters. Um, the social contributors to health are called out specifically in action areas as well as woven together throughout the plan. Uh, the next slide is a visualization of our care continuum. Um, when we think of our care continuum, uh, we think of promotion, prevention, early intervention, treatment, and recovery. Um, it is essential to Vermont's system of care that we strengthen all aspects of the continuum in order to achieve the best outcomes. And we know that there are areas of the continuum um, that are overlooked, um, and that includes uh, uh, promotion and prevention. Uh, so we tend to prioritize treatment, um, and we feel, and what is reflected in this plan, um, is equal attention to promotion and prevention efforts that will allow us to get upstream um, to impact long-term change um, down the road, um, as well as continuing to invest in the continuum of care um, so that when individuals require treatment um, or higher levels of care, they can access it uh, in a timely way. So the next slide is the visual of Vision 2030, um, which essentially has eight action areas um, that are aligned around that quadruple aim of healthcare. Um, your slide should have a framework for action listed on it. Um, and okay, that's slide number um, 11. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll be walking through each of the action areas um, to give you a sense of the very specific um, goals of that action area, and we've articulated the short-term, mid-term, and long-term strategies associated with each of those. 
The eight action areas include, number one, promoting health and wellness, uh, number two, in influencing social contributors to health, uh, number three, eliminating stigma and discrimination, action area four is expanding access to community-based care, action area five is enhancing intervention and discharge planning services to support Vermonters in crisis, action area six is ensuring that peer services are accessible at all levels of care, Action Area 7 is ensuring that service delivery is person-led, and Action Area 8 is committing to workforce development and payment parity. So those are the eight action areas uh, that we have focused on uh, for our 10-year plan. So Action Area 1 is related to promoting health and wellness, and again, getting upstream, uh, we all know that the earlier we intervene, the better the outcomes. Um, and this is an area we need to continue to focus on in our system of care in Vermont. Um, again, essential to this, this idea is the concept of healthy communities. Um, we also have to pay attention to caring for the caregivers, um, ensuring that families are supported, um, that peers and staff that are working in our community mental health agencies, in our hospitals, have the support that they need uh, to do their work and to do their work well. Um, some of the high-level action area um, items include having culturally and linguistically appropriate resources in communities, um, that we partner with peers and other statewide programs and initiatives to improve and expand resources, we expand insurance coverage for employee wellness programs, and support the development of trauma-informed diverse workplaces. On your next slide, which is slide 14, thank you. Um, we've broken down the action area uh, by theme, so you'll notice on the left there's three themes, um, practice improvement, collaboration, and workplace wellness. You'll also see the short-term, mid-term, and long-term strategies that we've articulated uh, for each of the action areas. Again, we want to create a path for accountability for ourselves as systems partners to really concretely move these pieces forward. As we all know around this table, this is a business of small steps, um, but we want to be clear about what those action areas are so we can target our resources appropriately. Uh, so the themes here in terms of practice improvement, collaboration, and workplace wellness. Uh, practice improvement includes building trauma-informed communities and safe spaces that are person-led. Um, at midterm is continuing to enhance and focus on social and emotional learning in schools. Uh, this requires partnership with our early care and learning providers, uh, the continued work that we are doing in public schools, uh, but going even more upstream um, to ensure that we're focusing on the social and emotional development of young children. Uh, we all know some of the data that we're looking at in terms of the rate of children under the age of nine, uh, whether they're coming into state's custody, increase in access of emergency services across our system of care, um, there is an urgent and important need to attend um, to the mental health needs of our youngest Vermonters. Um, and that starts with social emotional uh, learning um, at the youngest ages. Uh, we also want to work towards universal screening uh, and uh, also uh, appropriate referral and same day access to treatment and care. And then long term, we need to look at implementation of all of these areas, including focus on the caregivers um, and health and wellness. Uh, and health benefits that meet employee needs. So, and as we're talking about the health benefits and insurance coverage for wellness, there also is a significant amount of work that can go on that doesn't include uh, a premium payment mm -hmm. for wellness, and that is changing workplace habits and environment so that people are, their needs are more respected. So this would be without uh, and so is there a section there that would include employers and having them become <coughs> more engaged in providing wellness opportunities of Absolutely. all types? And so, yes, that's so. exactly right. Um, we know that individuals um, in our workplace, in our workforce, um, for those who are providing direct care, um, who need um, to ensure that their wellness needs are being met, and just broadly across employers in the state. Um, we know that many adults um, are experiencing um, isolation, loneliness, depression, um, so your employer um, becomes an opportunity um, to provide a bit of a safety net for you and to ensure that 
um, your mental health needs can be met um, that also directly aligns with um, reducing stigma uh, because many individuals who would benefit from seeking care don't. But so I, I kind of link the prevention piece here too. So mm -hmm. if you're going to have staggered start times so that people can get their kids to school mm -hmm. and the children feel safer having their parents getting them there. I mean there's different ways of looking mm -hmm. at employer practices that might support sure. um, yeah, upstream mm -hmm. family wellness. Um, action area two is focusing on influencing the social contributors to health. Um, and we are using the language of social contributors, which are also fondly known as social determinants of health, um, which are conditions in which people are born, work, live, um, and that impacts a wide range of health fun functioning and quality of life outcomes. Um, particularly for children, we all know um, related to ACEs that children are setting long-term health trajectories in their earliest years. Uh, so this becomes essential um, that we pay attention to this across the system of care. Uh, we also want to ensure that Vermonters' basic needs are being met. Um, this includes food stability, housing, transportation, affordable and accessible child care, employment, and a community that is responsive to their needs. Just a few things. Just a few things. Um, but I think it is important that when we think about a 10-year plan for mental health and integration, that these pieces are fundamental um, to that. Uh, for example, we just um, uh, put out our analysis of residential bed needs, um, which I'm sure we'll be back to report on in more depth to the committee. Um, but when we looked at barriers um, to transitioning individuals out of our inpatient hospitals across the state, one of the most significant barriers was simply housing. Um, so when we look across our continuum of care and we try to expand flow in the system, sometimes we forget about those fundamental aspects that there's an individual in our inpatient, many individuals in our inpatient system of care that are ready to go back home and they can't. Uh, because they don't have access to housing. So I do think it's important as we move forward that we continue to look at all aspects of uh, basic needs um, and the housing piece uh, becomes significantly important. Um, and then of course this is lifted up in a specific action area, uh, but continuing to build, empower, and sustain a strong peer network uh, throughout Vermont. So action area two, um, Kathy, what slide are they on? 16. Great. Um, so on the left-hand column, you'll see basic needs and protective factors, uh, the short-term, mid-term, and long-term strategies to achieve that. Um, in the short term, we want more public education on health equity and mental health. Again, looking at social and emotional learning um, across the state, in our public schools, uh, in our early care and learning settings. Um, in the midterm, we want to continue to expand support for housing, transportation, and food, um, and continue to build on some of the, um, what I would consider, powerful efforts that are already underway. Um, early MTSS, early multi-tiered systems of support, um, has been something that our early care and learning partners have been working on. That becomes an essential opportunity for us to build on and expand Again, this 10-year plan not only articulates areas where we have gaps, but areas where we have strengths in the system that we can build on and expand. Um, one of the challenges that we have in Vermont, um, I would call the implementation gap, um, that what we use, we don't use with fidelity, we don't use it for a long enough time, um, and we don't use it at a scale sufficient to impact the social change that we really want. Um, so really honing in on the targeted areas that we want to invest in to move our system forward. And then the other area that I think is a challenge for us and an opportunity is how do we start to articulate and track the savings that we achieve by primary prevention efforts. Um, that also becomes important for us as a system. Uh, action area three um, is related to eliminating stigma and discrimination. Uh, we know that many individuals who would benefit from mental health care and treatment simply don't um, for fear of labeling prejudice, and what we would call discrimination. Um, to eliminate that uh, will require deep understanding of mental health issues within the context of whole health. Uh, we want our young people to feel empowered and supported, um, and quite frankly, I think our young people are our future uh, when it comes to tolerance, 
uh, when it comes to compassion, when it comes to empathy. Um, in my spare time, I run the Waterbury Soccer League um, in my community. And there is a story uh, that really um, stuck with me. Um, I was under the tent sorting metals, getting things ready for the afternoon. I think it was snowing on our jamboree, which is pretty difficult <laughs> for ball soccer. Um, and two little boys walked by me, and they might have been in third grade. Um, and I just overheard their conversation, and he was talking to his buddy, saying, you know, I was talking to my therapist yesterday, and she said, sometimes I just need to pull the plug and let the anxiety flow out. Um, and it was just a, a normal, regular conversation, conversation between two young boys walking across the soccer field, and that gave me hope, um, because that's exactly what we need, um, is that, yeah. So, and we've been working on a bill in here on the EMS Wellness Commission mm -hmm. and hearing some really startling stories from adult males. Mm -hmm. And so they will, the, the younger kids will now fall right into the mm -hmm. process of mm -hmm. working together. Yeah. And when we speak in public schools, I mean, just the compassion and empathy um, that our young people have. Um, their lack of judgment. Um, so again, I think it gives us hope, and we do have an opportunity to continue to expand and build on that strength um, to decrease stigma and discrimination as we go forward. So the specific areas under action area three, um, the themes are education, social emotional development, and wellness. Um, again, continuing to expand initiatives to educate the public on mental health and supports, identifying trainings, increasing support for evidence-based and best practices um, that teach about the social development of children in schools. Um, also, our healthcare partners, um, this was an area that they were really interested in um, in having more training for their own staff, their nursing staff, in terms of understanding mental health um, decreasing any stigma or discrimination that folks seeking mental health care in our emergency departments, in primary care, um, in our health care settings in general uh, was something that they really felt like their staff needed more support around, um, mm -hmm. more training and education. Um, and then longer term to fully integrate mental health education in all aspects of education, workforce, and community partnerships. Action area four is expanding access to community-based care. Uh, we heard time and time again in the listening sessions uh, from Vermonters who are increasingly concerned about access to mental health services and what happens when access is delayed. Um, this includes the enhancement of existing programs, the exploration of promising practices, especially in rural areas. Uh, when we look across our continuum of care, uh, we've made efforts um, to increase our inpatient capacity in the system of care. Uh, we're making efforts in terms of our residential system of care. We have to continue to attend to our community mental health system of care, um, ensure that our community mental health system has the resources uh, to do its work well. Um, they are essential to the system, and that is something that family members uh, brought up over and over again. Um, also ensuring that uh, the public understands how to access the mental health system, um, improving client navigation supports, um, and increasing outreach and education um, in the communities. So we have a bill in here um, on, for the Rutland Pilot Project on the mobile mental health care program. Mm -hmm. And so this would fit in with this set of community activities. I know there are other things going on in other uh, municipalities but so and I don't know if you're going to be testifying on that bill or not yes um, so mobile response um, was actually one of the recommendations of the 10-year plan um, so it's uh, incredible to be sitting here um, having that initiative moving forward as an opportunity to expand expand upstream mobile response crisis intervention earlier on I'll speak a little bit to that more specifically as we go forward um, and also that our community mental health agencies um, are just doing incredible work in terms of diverting individuals from even needing to need hospital level of care um, through their existing programs. Um, but I was recently um, reporting on some data 
um, and house health care related to our FY21 budget. And when you look at the trend line of Vermonters accessing emergency services, I mean, it is incredible how much that has increased. And our community mental health partners um, are managing within existing resources to meet that need, um, but it's clearly an area uh, that we need to look at comprehensively across the state. We are looking at it. Great. Um, so the specific areas outlined here um, in the 10-year plan are focused on public education, centralized resource, local and regional services, and evidence-based practices. Uh, again, um, we've heard about um, individuals just trying to navigate the system of care to understand where they need to, uh, uh, where they can access resources. Our community mental health agencies work very hard to try to educate the public um, on who they can call, where they can go, when they can. Um, but again, I think it's an opportunity for us to continue to look at that. Um, to address gaps in evidence-based services for underserved Vermonters, where are we missing opportunities, and continuous improvement on expansions to community-based programming. Um, mobile response is an example of that. Um, there are additional areas um, across our community mental health system of care that we need to continue to look at um, to strengthen and expand. So, and in, in your thinking about this, um, having measurable outcomes becomes really key. Yes. And knowing that one of the waiver goals that we have is reduced suicide. Um, so the linkage between the, the programs that start up to in closing the gaps. Yes. And how are we keeping data on that? That's, something, that's a question we have to ask in here as we're passing bills. So, <laughs> So any thoughts that you have for us on that going forward while we look at the mobile response team mm -hmm. or whatever um, would be very helpful. And I don't know if you have a broader uh, metric in place. So specifically, um, and I think accountability is essential, um, mm -hmm. we need to measure our outcomes. Mm -hmm. Um, which is exactly why we presented mobile response as a pilot. That is what is a pilot is designed to do, um, where we can implement an approach, we can measure it, we can fine tune it. Um, so I believe when Laurel Omland um, from the Department of Mental Health testified, um, there are over 10 evaluation metrics that we are looking at specifically for mobile response. Of course, number one is a reduction in ED utilization um, in that community. Uh, and one of the reasons that Rutland was selected um, was because from a very data-driven approach. Um, when you look at their overall ED utilization um, for children and youth, um, it is the highest in the state. Uh, we actually received some data and information um, from the Vermont Care Partners Network um, mm -hmm. that identified um, Rutland's data <coughs> related to when crisis services are delivered in an ED. Um, those numbers were the highest. Um, and again, the ED might be an appropriate place for some individuals. Uh, for many individuals, if we can triage to that need earlier and more upstream in a family's home, in a school setting, that is ideal. So those are some of the metrics that we're looking at. Um, our suicide prevention array of initiatives also has significant metrics associated with each of the areas that we're looking at. So action area five, um, and I also just want to note um, that uh, one of our designated agency CEOs is in the room today, George Karabakis. Um, he was also a member of the think tank. Um, so just wanted to acknowledge his contrib contributions as a leader um, and I'm sure could comment um, on some of these pieces as well. Great. Okay. Uh, action area five is enhancing intervention and discharge planning services to Vermonters in crisis. Um, again, uh, we are worried um, that the emergency departments in the state of Vermont are being perceived as the only door to accessing care. Um, and that is concerning uh, because the ED door um, can quickly become a pathway to higher levels of more restrictive and more expensive care. And we want to divert anyone much earlier um, before they even need um, to access uh, services or care in an emergency department, uh, which is not what they're designed to do, um, or to need uh, then higher levels of care. Uh, there was a national survey that was conducted, I believe, in 2018 uh, by the National Council on Behavioral Health um, of those who were seeking treatment for their family uh, members, for themselves, 
um, and over 46% didn't even know where to begin. Um, so again, it's essential that as we strengthen our community-based systems, we also want to ensure that the general public is aware of what additional resources are available to them um, so that they don't just see the ED as being the only door to accessing care. Um, it's also important to remember Vermont has 14 emergency departments across the state. Um, we had more than 10,000 individuals um, who walked through the doors of those EDs. Over half of them were discharged back to the community. Um, so again, just an important data point for us to keep our eye on, you know, how are we strengthening that community system of care um, to prevent individuals from needing to see the ED as their only way to access care. Uh, so essentially, we have to address, I think, both the social and fiscal costs of more restrictive and higher levels of care um, and try to align our resources um, to prevent that need, um, which I think will save both resources um, and create better outcomes for Vermonters. Um, so again, some of the bullet point he points here are clear and consistent messaging that support individuals in crisis. Um, implementing practices that improve an individual's experience while in crisis, um, education and training for providers in trauma-informed person-led care, continuing to strengthen prevention care coordination and hospital diversion programs, and development of alternative options uh, to emergency department places, our uh, placements. We talked a lot in the think tank, uh, the group that I was in in particular, um, looking at potential urgent care models um, that could divert individuals. Um, if you have a health care issue, um, many of us access urgent care on a fairly regular basis, or that's a resource that we have in our community. Um, it would be nice from a parity perspective um, that if you are experiencing a mental health challenge, um, that you might be able to access that same kind of urgent care um, as someone who has, was experiencing a health care challenge. Um, there's also an exciting um, initiative that's happening at the United Counseling Services um, where they have implemented an urgent care model um, for the pediatric population. Um, I'm sure they'd be happy um, to report to the committee on that. Um, but again, we continue to move in the right direction, but want to make sure we're thinking about scaling these efforts statewide to have maximum impact. Um, the strategies under Action Area 5, um, the themes include access, transitions, and outreach and coordination. Um, the implementation of mobile response um, is a significant action area uh, that we are moving forward um, as part of the recommendation of the 10-year plan. Um, as you heard in testimony, uh, mobile response allows us to respond more proactively to a child, youth, or family um, before something becomes such a crisis that it might require you to go to the ED. Um, when we look at the trends in children under the age of nine um, who are accessing emergency services, overall the pressure on our emergency services systems within our community mental health agencies, um, this funding will allow Rutland as the pilot site um, to implement a mobile response team which will be able to respond um, face to face um, with children and families in their homes um, to provide that level of care. Uh, myself and the previous secretary um, convened uh, a meeting uh, related to our overall concern as a state about the amount of children who are waiting in EDs um, for days at a time. Um, and we had family members there um, who all reflected on the need um, and their desire. If only I could have called someone and they could have come to my home and helped myself and my family in that moment. Um, and one family even reflected on, you know, 10 years ago, um, they felt like they were able to receive um, that kind of response. Um, but because of the pressure on the system, the increased need, um, it's an area that we need to continue to attend to. Uh, we work very closely with the Vermont Federation for Families on this, um, who also uh, work directly with families across the state. Um, and this is something they have told us time and time again um, that they want and need. Um, again, continuing to also look at um, urgent care as an opportunity for our mental health system of care. Um, there's approaches such as the living room model, which is an alternative um, to emergency departments. Um, 
and uh, assess, accessing uh, hospital diversion programs across the state. Uh, we've done a good job in expanding some of our hospital diversion programs um, through Northeast Family um, Institute, NFI, um, continuing to focus on hospital diversion programs uh, for adults as well, um, and ensuring that folks are aware of crisis supports and services that are available in their community, um, including the crisis beds that are available through our designated community mental health agencies. Action area six is related to peer services and ensuring that they are accessible at all levels. Uh, one of the things that we know is expanding peer services across our system of care um, have shown impressive potential and outcomes in other states, uh, and we think we can do better in Vermont. Um, other states who have implemented peer services, whether it's access and emergency departments um, at other points of care, um, Peer intervention and support um, can be incredibly powerful uh, for individuals who might be experiencing a mental health crisis. Um, they're a valued um, component and a critical component of our mental health system of care, um, and we'd like to continue to expand on that work in Vermont. We also need to understand um, how our peer workforce, how peers um, also fit in um, from a credentialing standpoint, from a a billing standpoint, um, and Medicaid reimbursement. There has actually been some debate, um, and I think um, folks involved in this peer work about whether or not um, they should be billing, um, what that could look like, what that credentialing should look, could look like, um, but if we were able to do that successfully, it could open doors um, to potential funding of peer services uh, that we think are urgent and important. Um, so one of our recommendations is that there is a peer-led work group um, that can help us think comprehensively as a state of what those opportunities are, what that credentialing could or could not look like um, to make recommendations as we go forward. We also have areas um, and bright spots in the state that we want to expand upon. Uh, we have a two-bed peer respite program uh, that makes peer supports available to individuals. Uh, we have the Soteria House um, which is also uh, considered hospital diversion or utilized um, as step down from inpatient level of care that is all peer run. Um, we've seen um, on the substance abuse side of uh, the system um, their great success um, in implementing uh, peers um, and peer recovery coaches in emergency departments across the state of Vermont. Uh, we think it would be powerful to think about the integration of peers related to uh, mental health supports across our emergency departments as well. Uh, so this idea of looking at peer navigators, et cetera, this is something that um, the think tank and Vermonters uh, really felt was important. Um, in terms of the action areas, uh, they're broken down into three main themes, which are standards and guidance, informing programming, and strategic placement. Um, as I mentioned, establishing this peer work group um, that can look at credentialing and aligning, aligning standards. Um, opportunity for federal reimbursement of peer services uh, feels like a significant opportunity and lever for us potentially, but again, we have to have the cr credentialing and standards somewhat articulated before we can do that. Um, and more guidance and educational opportunities for community providers. Uh, related to um, the opportunities for inclusion of peers um, and what that can mean uh, for those individuals. Um, we'd like that peer work group um, to advise uh, the Department of Mental Health on a regular basis so that we can continue to move this forward. Action Area 7 uh, is ensuring that service delivery is person-led. Um, this is a fundamental value um, that Vermont has long held uh, related to our mental health system of care. Um, it's building a culture of care that treats individuals with dignity and respect, um, supporting individuals in their own path towards recovery and recovery goals. Um, Person-led systems provide expertise and resource that support an individual's goals. Um, that includes their needs, their values, their cultural identity and interests. Um, even when the care is provided to folks who are on an involuntary status. Uh, so this is something that's essential to recovery, best practices, something we need to continue to pay attention to in the state of Vermont. 
Um, we want to ensure that same-day access, access solution-focused intervention. Um, also reshaping practices that can include advanced directives um, so that individuals um, can articulate and lead their own care uh, when they're in more of a position of wellness um, versus at a point of being in mental health crisis. You're thinking of ONH, NH. You're thinking of orders of hospitalization and orders of non-hospitalization, among other things. I think how um, advanced directions, uh, directives could inform orders of non-hospitalization and ensuring that the care management that we're providing for individuals um, is really aligned with their own goals um, for treatment and recovery. Uh, not an easy area. Not an easy area, um, but it was an area that both Vermonters um, and the think tank uh, felt warranted additional attention. Um, the specific areas of this are related to services and workforce. Um, again, we have an opportunity to continue to educate our staff on what person-led treatment really is. That's in our inpatient facilities across our designated community mental health agencies. Um, I think there are areas where um, this is happening, um, and it's something we have to continue to attend to. That's one of the main tenets of practice improvement and continuous quality improvement, that we have to continue to train our staff um, in these best practices. Um, ensuring that advanced directives are offered um, and that person-led treatment is truly implemented across the state of Vermont, across all of our providers. Finally, um, action area eight um, is committing to workforce development and payment parity. Uh, we all know that workforce development um, is absolutely essential to achieving Vision 2030. Um, without offering the resources, tools, and employee benefits, um, our dedicated community care providers um, need. Um, we can't meet the urgent health needs of our vulnerable populations without supporting our workforce. Uh, workforce development and payment parity, we think underpin a strong system that can deliver high quality services and supports. And when we think of payment parity, we think specifically of equal rates of payments for the same services when provided by mental health professionals as compared to health professionals. Uh, so this is something we need to continue to look at um, across the state of Vermont. Um, some of the high-level bullet areas that we want to focus on are implementation of approaches um, from the Mental Health, Developmental Disabilities, and Substance Use Disorder Workforce Report, um, looking at um, other aspects of our workforce in terms of community health workers and peers, um, ensuring that our workforce is well-trained, having payment parity across healthcare providers, uh, feels like a big area that we need to continue to tackle um, and expanding coverages for all services for Vermonters um, regardless of their insurance. Uh, so these are areas that the think tank, we had a very specific group that was focused on this. Um, and again, uh, just these are high level action areas, kind of summary for the committee. Um, the report itself is much more detailed um, in terms of the specific next steps that we would be taking. So and as you're going through some of that, so obviously the payment parity issue is one that we're also very concerned about. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> trying to improve access for folks in communities and community services relates directly to this mm -hmm. and how uh, private insurers incorporate payment for counseling sessions and mm -hmm. peer group sessions. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, there's a lot. This is just, it isn't simply mental health that we're talking about mm -hmm. here. Or, as you said, it's a substance use disorder, but it's also other, other areas um, that really cry out for payment parity help. Yes. Yeah. And one specific example too is we when we convened that meeting with, you know, individuals waiting in EDs as we move forward with mobile response, you know, one of the um, concrete action steps was meetings with Blue Cross Blue Shield, for example, to talk about can these home based services also be reimbursed um, for family members. Right. Um, so these are the kinds of conversations that we need to have uh, regardless of what your insurance is um, to ensure that you can access the resources that you need. And knowing that Medicaid does pay for this stuff. That's correct. Mm, I know. <laughs> Puts the burden on the state. Okay. Uh, the 
Specific themes under this action area are capacity, quality, training, and diversity, and inclusion. Um, again, this continues to look at initiating um, workforce recruitment strategies, um, training, improving working conditions, and support. Uh, we're all grappling with significant workforce challenges across the state of Vermont, healthcare, and mental health partners. Um, working towards parity and reimbursement rates. Again, we, are, we do this in pockets. Um, how do we have a more comprehensive approach uh, to addressing that? Um, and again, ensuring that our workforce has the appropriate supports, education, and training um, to support um, their day-to-day -day work um, and to encourage uh, their professional development. So this is um, not the end. Uh, this is just the beginning from the department's perspective. Uh, we felt um, it was an urgent and important opportunity for us to articulate a 10-year vision that very strategically outlined the short-term, mid-term, and long-term actions and strategies to get us there. It creates a framework um, by which decision-making um, can be held within um, to ensure that our investments and opportunities that we're looking at are aligned with our 10-year vision. Um, and that there are very specific action areas that the department will be taking um, upon submission of the report um, that we are beginning to work on. Um, implementation is critical. Uh, we have a policy team at the Department of Mental Health. Um, we'll be continuing to provide leadership on this. Um, again, as I mentioned uh, earlier on in the presentation, we really want to engage you as legislators in the creation of an appropriate structure such as a council or board. Um, that would have the authority um, to oversee and guide strategies in this plan um, that would require commitments to a common vision that would bring um, healthcare and mental health partners uh, together uh, to achieve that vision. Um, as I mentioned, we do have some specific language um, related to what that council or board um, could look like. Um, we are proposing um, that this would be chaired uh, by the Commissioner of Mental Health um, that some of those representatives would include folks from the Green Mountain Care Board, um, the Agency of Education, uh, uh, key leadership from One Care, um, representatives from the Vermont Medical Society, the Vermont Association of Hospitals, Vermont Care Partners, by state um, the University of Vermont Medical School, um, also other representatives from our hospital partners, um, commercial payers, including Blue Cross, Blue Shield, and MVP, um, and other um, education centers across the state. So we can provide this specific language. That would be you. helpful. Yeah. We, we do have a placeholder up there for okay. the 10-year plan. Right. And um, so we'll have some time to look at this, um, if not next week, when we get back after um, town meeting. Excellent. So um, it, it'll be a start. I understand that, and I, I don't think that the House is passing us anything related to the 10-year plan at this time. I will be re-communicating with Bill Lipper about that, but um, it does give us an opportunity to go forward a little bit. But the other, so I think that's probably the best option. The other option is to put it in with a Rutland mobile unit, but it mm -hmm. probably doesn't make sense. And the other piece, in order, again, to create accountability um, and commitment right. to this 10-year plan and the integration of mental health within health care. Um, we also want some benchmarks in terms of us needing to report back mm -hmm. to the legislature related to our progress on implementation. Um, so creating those structures of accountability, from my perspective, uh, feel important mm -hmm. um, so that we can continue to move this work forward in a meaningful way. That's also included in here. Okay, are there are they specific goals? Uh, or charge the charge to that commission included in there because I could see it growing like gangbusters. Hmm. Um, I don't know if it's as specific as what you're asking for, so we could certainly suggest some areas in terms okay. of the specific charge um, that the council would be focused on. Okay, if you can get that to us, then that'll give us an opportunity to. to uh, we'll put it up on our web page and then. Uh, members of the committee can look at it and we can make recommendations for um, for the legislation. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, other short-term uh, strategies that the department will be taking on is to conduct an inventory and analysis of short-term actions um, 
uh, and the resource assets that we currently have that we can build upon in a more targeted way. Um, again, some of this is you know building on the strengths of the system that we already have. Um, so the Department of Mental Health has actually already begun that work. Um, also to try to convene tables and forums um, that are maybe beyond the traditional scope of the Department of Mental Health, again, as an effort to engage stakeholders um, and healthcare providers um, in these conversations. Um, that we will be finalizing the Department of Mental Health's um, state system of care plan using information and strategies from the 10-year plan. Um, we will also be including this in our annual reporting on Act 79, um, and we'll be creating an evaluation framework um, for the monitoring and measuring of the success of this plan. Can I ask a question? I'm looking at the, the Vision 2030 short-term stakeholder activities. Uh, that slide. Okay. With the with, are you, you're not there yet. I won't go there. Yet. Um. I apologize. Which slide number is that? It's thirty. Thirty. Okay. Do you, uh, I don't want to go there if you're not ready to go there. Is that this one? No, no, it's no, the big chart with no. the no, You keep going. Okay. You keep going. I'll, 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 I'll remember what I was going to ask. Go ahead. Okay. So I, this, what this slide articulates um, is that inventory and analysis of some of the short-term actions and resources mm -hmm. that we have. Um, so it's very small. I apologize. I think this was really just to demonstrate where we felt like we had some assets that we could build upon. Which um, one are you talking about now? The uh, one that I was on? Yes. 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 The one exactly. Hour number three. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so I'm looking at action areas, and I see one is actually the council, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So then would that mean that the goals for number one would be to develop, analyze, make recommendations about all the, take all the ones that are there. Do you want them to work further? I'm just thinking about the legislation. Yeah, let me think about that a little think bit. Think about that. Um, bit. And uh -huh. how, you know, what we've done in terms of our analysis of short term sure. assets um, could inform the charge of the council yeah. to ensure that their work is very targeted and yeah. focused. Good. Yeah. Great. Helpful. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and again, very specifically um, in terms of how um, our overall FY21 budget this year interacts with this 10-year plan, um, which is important. Um, mobile response is a specific action area that was lifted up in the 10-year plan that we are moving forward. Um, suicide prevention was also a specific action area in the 10-year plan. Um, we've put forward um, a comprehensive approach to suicide prevention in Vermont, which includes the expansion of zero suicide the National Lifeline um, and the expansion of our Elder Care Clinician Program. Um, we are also looking to um, expand our community and street outreach programs across Vermont. Um, again, this is kind of pairing law enforcement with mental health social workers. Um, that was also embedded uh, within the 10-year plan. Um, that is something that we are moving forward with expanding in the Washington County area, which we're very excited about. Um, and also, we did just put out an RFP uh, for a peer workforce development grant, um, which uh, we, they will be essential um, in moving forward with that action area related to peer credentialing um, and how we think about potential uh, Medicaid reimbursement down the road. So just wanted to make sure the committee was aware of some of the things we've already put in place um, that are reflective of the 10-year uh, plan and vision. Good. Questions? Wow. It's well, a lot. We're going to need some peer support after. <laughs> <laughs> I, I apologize for stepping out. I had no 48th graders, okay. and it took a little longer than I thought. Mm -hmm. sure. Thank you. Yeah. 45 minutes. <laughs> you, you've done a lot. I know, mm -hmm. that, I know that your presentation in other committees has lasted a little bit longer mm -hmm. and more in depth, uh, but we're, we will look at the report you know, the 10-year plan, right. I've already looked at it, and I just think it's a significant, it's a significant document. There's a lot of work to do. It could be overwhelming, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I think uh, a lot of the things that you've been doing and we've been doing um, have, are leading us in these directions, mm -hmm. so really good. Great. Well, thank you for your time this morning. I really appreciate it.
Thank you. And Thank you'll you. get you'll you'll get yes, this. We will get this email online. this to the committee. Uh, Excellent. If you send it to Dory, and then we'll get it up on our page, and then any other thoughts you have about that last table, um, and then how to build a charge. I think we may want to refine whatever it is you have. Of course, we're senators. Maybe we won't. No, we'll see. But great. great. Thank well, you. Thank you again for your time this morning. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's been terrific. Yeah. Good work. Thank you. I know how hard you've been working. Thank you. Yeah. Really. That's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> it's good to be young and energetic. <laughs>